Good morning, Jay. Good morning. It Thanks is for so, having me. This is exciting. It is so nice to see you. Um, I know you and I have spoken a little bit about our market centers here in Montclair and Summit and, and Westfield. Um, I was just digging around doing a little cyber stalking of you. And I understand you went to graduate school just up the road and over the river from here at NYU. Is that right? That's right. I applied to a bunch of schools. You know, everybody, every writer wants to go to the Iowa Writers Workshop and, you know, drive through, you know, cornfields and see lots of pigs. Don't, don't make, writing. don't make but fun I, of Iowa, Jay. I'm from Iowa and I went to school there. <laughs> but that is like, no, that is the Mecca. But like, I actually didn't think I would get in there or NYU. NYU is a very prestigious writing school too, but I got into NYU and I was like, wow, okay. I got family in Staten Island. I have a friend uh, and a, a second cousin in publishing. Um, so I went, I actually stayed in Hoboken my first week and uh, then moved into a little apartment on Astor Place. But yeah, I had, I had friends in Jersey. We'd go over there. I used to hang out in this place called the Shannon in Hoboken where my mm -hmm. second cousin's husband, Ray, was a bartender and it was great. I'm, yeah, y'all live in a great part of the world. I, <laughs> I met my wife up there, come on, so. And she's originally a Badger, I understand. So, uh, yep. From... She grew up in Fargo, went to Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Wisconsin for college, and then came to, I think, New York for a birthday party. She took a bus and just stayed. And we met at a friend's birthday party a couple of years later. That's, that's a great story. Well, when the world goes back to normal and it's a little safe, safer to travel, we'd love to have you back in, uh, in person. That'd be great. Um, let's do it in the summertime. I've got a friend that goes to Manasquan every summer from like seventh grade, and I can go down to the coast and pretend like it's the 1950s. Awesome. We'll see you at the beach. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jay, you know that our theme for today is growth. And, yes. um, you know, I was just remembering that last year at our State of the Market, Sue Adler spoke, and I remember her talking a lot about that and how her business really has grown to the degree that she has. Yes. In your book, you talk about success being an inside job, put yourself together and your world falls into place. Help us kick that into a, into high gear. What do we need to be thinking about to, to put our internal personal growth on steroids so that we can see that having implications all over our world? Uh, I love that. And it's, it's truly is an inside job. And one of the things, you know, Gary defines leadership as teaching people how to think. And all leadership begins with self-leadership. And as we learn how to think so that we can do what we need to do when we need to do it so we can get what we want when we want it, big mouthful, but that's a Garyism. Um, we're bringing leadership to ourselves. And so for a lot of us, it's just about like, this is the time of year when we're looking at our goals. Maybe we're still really committed to that diet or exercise program, right? That we started the year off with. Um, a lot of people, when they think about personal improvement and personal growth, they go to physical and health. And that's great because we need energy to do great things. But we also need to think about how we think and are we feeding our minds? And so, you know, especially last year, I think a lot of us became sensitive to how much we wanted to expose ourselves to the news, right? Because it wasn't always positive. And are we putting in positive stuff? So my challenge to folks would be if you want to grow on your personal journey, what are the areas in your business where you lack confidence? Um, because that's often a sign that we need training or coaching. And then do you have a plan for improving them? And frankly, we all have that spot. We have our blind spots where maybe we're not as good at hiring as we want and we should go to career visioning. Maybe our personal finances aren't where we, they should be. And therefore we're asking things from our business that our business shouldn't be asked to do to solve our spending problem at home, right? So maybe we need to get enrolled in a Dave Ramsey course. Maybe we need to focus on learning uh, better financial intelligence. I can't tell you what they need, but I can tell you how to solve it, is that you can form a plan. And for me, it usually starts with books or training or a coach. Um, and a mentor can be a placeholder for a coach, but who can I choose to be accountable to? Like we're adults. Like you may have, do you have a coach, Shannon? I do. Right. I do. So if I have a coach too. My coach does not hold me accountable. There's nothing my coach can do. Reach through the Zoom thing from Utah and tell me when I'm doing misbehaving, no. But I choose to be accountable to the process. So we can choose to be accountable to our goals, 
We can choose to be accountable to our life, to our coach, and to our plan, and then live that plan. And we can go down that road, but if people aren't setting goals for their personal development, they are short circuiting their business growth. So when you talk about setting goals for your personal development, what we all, this time of year, realtors all set their business goals, right? Let's go through the categories and maybe using yourself as an example, or uh, what are the categories that you would recommend people think about this time of year to be setting their goals? Well, you can see the book over my shoulder. Um, The only page I've memorized is page 114. And that's where you have the seven circles of your life where you might apply the one thing. And um, for 14 years now, my wife and I have done a retreat where we set goals and we set goals in each of those areas. So um, what are the things that we need to do, the habits that we can build for our spiritual life, right? Do we have a mentor that we need for that? So it's spiritual, physical, um, next is personal, right? And a lot of us are working really hard and we don't really have a personal life. We don't have hobbies. We don't have things that we do to fill our own bucket. And so we're always taking care of our clients and taking care of our family or taking care of our people on our team and never taking care of ourselves. And that, that's that old line, you know, when you're on the airplane, who's, who do you put the mask on first? You or the kid by you? Do it to yourself. That's right. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you may be borrowing against account that comes due and you just won't be able to take care of the people you care about or that you've committed to taking care of. So we've got to make room for that in our lives. Then relationships, um, the key relationships, we set goals for our marriage. Um, we set goals for our partnerships that we have partners with, um, our kids. And now we have aging parents. We have two sets of aging parents. Like we have to actively plan for what needs to happen there. Then we have our job and our business and our money. And other people might have other categories that don't fall neatly into that. That's personal. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. you need to step back at least once a year and ask holistically, how am I doing in those areas? Like I would challenge people to grab that book and, and set a timer for one minute. And in one minute, go through each of those seven circles, spiritual, physical, personal, key relationships, job, business, money, and rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. And what I find, because you have to start with one, you can't do all seven at the same time. This is the one thing, not the seven things. Um, I find that people are usually most motivated to invest time and energy to improve themselves in the area where they have the most pain. So if you've been neglecting your physical health, right, you're overweight or you're just not healthy, you don't have the energy, you're not sleeping, fixing that often will create all kinds of little uh, halo effect in your life. And one uh, researcher we talked to in Australia, when people had built any habit, just new habit, I'm going to drink eight glasses of water a day. They then saw massive improvements in other areas of their life. Like there were fewer dirty dishes in the sink that they made their bed. Like all these other things come together. These other things come together. And here's my hypothesis. I can't prove it. When people understand that they actually have control of their lives, that they can change, like instead of feeling like they're adrift in this torrent, right, that they got swept away with their business and their life and their kids and all of, I mean, the pandemic, when they understand they actually do have the ability to make a positive change, it gives them the confidence to start doing a lot more for themselves. So I would challenge them, identify the area that matters most to them. And that could be the most pain or the most opportunity. And then how can you build a habit? How can we be better there and get a plan for that? So I know you get called in to consult with companies and you certainly spend a ton of time with the, the, the top brass there at KW, including, including Gary. What do you see to the degree that you can share? What do you see with us about how people at that level set goals, follow up with them, make sure their actions match their goals? What does that really look like? Um, I think the number one thing, and this has been when people ask Wendy or myself, like what's the number one gift you've got gotten from working for, with Gary, like a self-made billionaire for 18 years. I've been here for 20, working with him for 18, partners for 16. And he always challenges us to think bigger. So um, I was interviewing him, um, I guess, recently. And we actually, part of our our business planning clinic at the end of the year, we shared that video. 
And one of the things that Gary always reminds us to do is when we're setting goals for 2021, we need to actually ask a much bigger question. And this is true of Carl, our new CEO. This is true. I've actually interviewed two other billionaires. They have a big vision. They're looking at what do I want to achieve in my life or at the very least in the next five or 10 years. And then based on that, they're saying, well, what am I going to do in 2021? And the vast majority, the rest of us, and I'm guilty about half the time, even though I work with him and he's slapping me on the head, telling me not to do it, is that we tend to get really myopic. And we just think about this year and this month or this quarter, because we're really trying to have a great year, not necessarily a great career. So my number one thing would be, if you haven't done it, give yourself a Saturday morning and really give yourself the license to imagine what's possible for your life even if it still feels very improbable and start painting a picture of where you want to go. And based on that, then ask, well, what do we need to do this year to feel like really good about our progress? And this shows up in weird ways. Like Gary, I asked him like, how many of your goals do you hit? And he said, almost none. Because for me, a goal is a placeholder so I can learn how to behave every day to know I'm on track for that. And the moment I feel like I'm behaving or my company's behaving in a way to do that, I go and I raise the goal. Like he doesn't ever cross the finish line. And so this is also, I think, common when you read the biographies or you interview these people that are really changing the world, they're asking a bigger question. Every time I've been out of alignment with Gary, I mean, literally every time when, I, when we come back together as partners and we try to figure out how we get on the same page, what I realize is we are on the same page, but he's looking at a bigger picture than I am. I'm looking at the tiny corner of the screen and I'm seeing all the pixels and he's looking back and he's seeing the panorama. And until I can pan back and see the bigger picture, then I'm like, oh, well, of course we should do that. Sounds right? like he keeps pushing the horizon line back, which, which is uh, an exciting kind of person to be with, I'm sure. Yeah, it doesn't mean we don't get to celebrate the milestones along the way. I mean, a lot of people probably on this, maybe, maybe some of them from their business standpoint, they may have had their best year ever. I know a lot of people in a lot of related industries that had their best year ever last year, and it surprised all of us. We're like, what? Um, and it almost feels guilty because there's a lot of people who did not, had far from their best years. Um, there's almost two economies, but we have to celebrate that maybe privately, maybe not post on Facebook <laughs> if, some, if a lot of our clients are unemployed, but we can with our team or with our family celebrate that along the way because um, I know that's important, but having that big framework and then saying, so based on that, what do we do this year? And we, we wrote about that in the book. We call it goal setting to the now. Okay. The challenge with big goals in the future is we don't know how to behave this week to know that we're on track. And by working backwards from the goal, you know, based on what I want to do in five years, what do I do this year? Based on what I want to do this year, what do I have to do this month? Based on what I want to do this month, you see how I'm moving it back? I'm not saying based on where I want to be in five years, what I do this month. My month is based on my year. My week is based on my month. And my day is based on my week. And it's just a framework for breaking down these really big ambitious goals and going, hey, I don't have a crystal ball, but I feel like I'm doing the right thing. You know, I really loved what you started with there by saying, give yourself a Saturday morning and really allow yourself to dream and cast a big vision. It's hard to do in this busy, crazy world, but even- well, Saturday is maybe the worst day for a realtor to dream, maybe. right? They're out working with their clients. Okay, okay. but yes. But it, 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 is, it is powerful. And I know people do their vision boards and you hear so many success, you know, so many stories about that. But um, that's maybe the piece sometimes when we're talking about goal setting that we- that we forget to do. Is, is that what you see? Well, I alluded to it um, earlier for 14 years and my wife gets the whole credit. You know, we do business retreats. Like we go with our team. If you're on a team, maybe in your market center, right? You have a, a retreat and you plan for the next year or for the next five years. It's like, I mean, I get called in to do speeches most commonly to a group of executives that are in a spa somewhere or a golf course. They had to get out of their work environment so they could imagine their future for the next quarter or the next year. And it works for business. We've been doing it for decades in business, but we don't do it in our personal lives. And we kind of stumbled into that for our marriage relationship. And so I love it. I look forward to it, even though it's a lot of work, but we take usually one or two days minimum 
Like, you know, the first year we just actually, I think we went on Priceline, got a really cheap hotel downtown. We didn't even leave town. And I remember we gave a hundred bucks to our babysitter to watch our kids overnight. It was like the first night we'd spent away from them, which was great and glorious in itself when you have two small kids in diapers. But then we asked the question, what do we want to accomplish this year? In the beginning, it was just the next year. Now we look at a bigger vision and then based on that, the year. But I would encourage everyone to do that. Um, I can tell you, we've now been facilitating a goal setting retreat for four years for couples primarily, but also for teams and individuals. And the clarity people get by making just one day investment and just stopping what they're doing, not walk the dog, right? Don't wash the laundry, get out of that, that pattern of day-to-day -day life and try to imagine their future. They get so much clarity and clarity is what drives everything. If we're clear about what we're going, where we're going and why we're going there, it makes navigating this week or this month so much easier. You know, and, and spe speaking of the most important person in your world, your wife, um, I know I was actually speaking to somebody on our ALC yesterday. Both of us are actively binge listening to Empire Builders at the moment. Yay. Um, I love the story that she tells in one of the earlier episodes about uh, you and your wife, Wendy, being the only two to show up for a training on, I believe it was on determining your uh, net worth. It was me. Yeah. So um, I can tell you, this is like, if we, one of the most important things we try to get couples to do, and this is actually true of business partners. So any relationship that involves money, if you're not speaking the same language and on the same plan, it's going to create conflict. Um, so Mo Anderson, when I first joined the company was still our CEO, right? A lot of us just only know her as vice chairman and um, this cultural figure, right? That shows up for our inspirational brunch, but she was actually the CEO. And um, there were about 27 employees in KW and every Wednesday morning, we had a different training session, right? We're a training company, even at headquarters. And this particular week we were studying a balance sheet for a market center. Sounds exciting, Jay. Oh, sexy, right? Let's look <laughs> at our assets and liabilities, right? But I'm a new employee, so I show up and I'm the only person in the company who hasn't studied this or is admitting that they haven't studied this. And our CEO walks in the room. And this says a lot about Mo and how she values leadership as Gary defines it, teaching people how to think. I thought she'd cancel the class. Like what a waste of her valuable time to have an hour dedicated, not to a lot of employees, but just one guy who's not even out of his first 90 days. So we don't even know if he's gonna stick. But her reaction was, well, goody, instead of having a class, let's just have a one-on-one -on -one coaching session, which immediately scared the, you know, whatever out of me. I was like, what? That's a lot of attention when you're a brand new employee. But um, she walked me through a balance sheet. And that's, a, if people don't know what that is for your business, a lot of Real estate businesses don't have a balance sheet. We have a P&L um, because we don't have a lot of receivables and other things outside of the, the, the closing pending period. But a balance sheet shows you your assets and your liabilities. And some of your assets might be income that's owed to you by people. And some of your liabilities may be money that you owe to other people, debt. Well, she just challenged me and Wendy to do a personal balance sheet, a net worth sheet. And that was the very first time we'd ever heard the words net worth. And I remember I went home, uh, we were living in an apartment. We didn't even have a home yet. And we were like, the, the biggest assets we had, I had a 401k and we had a Toyota Tercel that within a year would go from four cylinders to three cylinders. Like it was not a good car. Um, but what was good is our net worth was positive. We didn't have a lot of debt. We didn't have a lot of credit card debt or school debt. And at the end of the day, our net worth was a little over $2,200. Um, we didn't do a lot with that at that time, other than we realized, wow, we're spending $1,400 a month or whatever on rent. We should be paying, we should have a mortgage, right? We should have an asset to represent that instead of just this cash flow. And so that prompted us to buy our first home. And then a couple of years later, with the millionaire real estate investor, I learned how important it is to track your net worth. And we started tracking it every month and set a goal to be millionaires in 10 years, which we did in about six and a half, honestly. Um, it was something that happens a lot faster if you're doing the right things. 
So I just said a lot. I'm sorry. You put a quarter in the jukebox and it just played a long song on you. Uh, no, but I, I love that song from the leadership through KW and you guys and you know, Mark King and Wealth Building Wednesdays. A couple of years ago, my husband and I locked ourselves in a in a hotel and forced ourselves to do that. We hate it. And it's really been liberating. Having that that net worth on paper is is uh, it simplifies things. So well, let me comp. I know Mark is going to teach wealth building, so we won't go too far down that for this session. But I will say this. You did something. You went and locked yourself in a hotel room. And I do think um, Jeff, who hosts our podcast on The One Thing, and I um, were teaching a class at Family Reunion a few years back. We had 2,000 people in the room. It was a 2,000-seat room, and we had people sitting in the aisles. And it was how billionaires set goals. And we were going to talk about some of the things that we talked about, having a bigger framework. And um, just off the cuff, I asked the question, how many of y'all have set goals? Raise your hand. And 2,000 plus hands raised were raised. And then I just asked the question, how many of you um, worked with your significant other in building those goals for this year? And all but four hands in the room went down. And the energy just completely changed. It was really weird. And two of the hands were me and Jeff. And one of the people in the front row was on my team and had done that. So there was only one person in the room that organically had made the decision to sit down with their significant other and say, these are my goals. And I would just say, it's still early, right? Um, it's early in the year. If you have not shared your goals with your significant other, sit down with them, say, this is what we're doing. This is why it's important. And ask, how do they feel about that? But I feel like we're entrepreneurs and real estate is one of the craziest, most entrepreneurial businesses. I mean, last year we all pivoted on a dime and we changed our businesses and, and did great. We're very entrepreneurial. That's exciting to us. We're driving a sports car, right? The real estate business is a Ferrari and we are driving down the coastal highway and enjoying the view and taking the curves. Our spouses are wearing a blindfold in the back seat. <laughs> They don't know what's coming. They're just being battered around and then they just feel sick. And we wonder why there's that tension. And nine times out of 10, it's because we just haven't involved them in the vision. And for me and Wendy, it's really important. I'm a massive introvert. Like I get my energy from being alone. I like to be in the woods with my dog, someone who's not gonna speak to me, right? I wanna read a book, I wanna watch a movie. She gets her energy by being around people. and guess what? Her birthday is usually about three or four days from mega camp every year. So guess who throws a massive birthday party at our house when I have to be on stage all day the next day? You do it with a smile? Um, no, when the police showed up, I, I stopped smiling, right? Because she's got a dance party in my backyard. Um, but because we got on the same page now for the last couple of years, she's not going to, she's going to throw these parties for herself. She just now rents a hotel room for me. But we now know, like I also understand, hey, this is not just her being social. These are people who send her referrals. She's building relationships with these people. Those people went on to be podcast hosts with her on Empire Building, right? Uh, Sue Adler is in their network with Amplify and all of that. These are really important relationships to her. We We were able to talk about it and now we have a plan where I'm not quietly furious with her for upsetting my preparation. And I can also just be happy for her. And I'm just watching a movie in a hotel room and going to bed early, which is what I need. So it, it just, that's one of the ways it shows up. So it's not too late, share your goals, share why they're important, why you're doing some of the things you're doing. You might be really surprised by how the home life improves when you do that. I'm well, passionate about that. I'm sorry, that's like a big soapbox issue for me. I, I love it. And you know, you remind me that as team leader, we need to bring some things into our world and run some trainings to encourage everybody to do that. Speaking of relationship building, that's what this business is, right? Yeah. So I've just, it's been my absolute joy to get to know you a little bit. Cause I mean, you are a big shot. You're like best selling New York times, wall street journal author, but, but you're such a nice guy, but thank you. I don't really know you that well yet. So how about before you go, 10 rapid fire questions so we know you a little better. Oh, this is fun. Okay, Ready? this is like, yeah. What'd you have for breakfast? Nothing, I'm intermittent fasting. So I had black coffee, but 
before I did that, my favorite go-to breakfast would be like a really healthy, like organic waffle with some really good peanut butter on it. Because we work out in the morning, so a little carbs, a little protein goes a long way. My next question was coffee or tea, but you already told us. Always coffee. Cold brew? It's almost never tea, unless I'm sick. I am a coffee guy. Okay. Cold brewed, hot brewed? Hot. Got it. Okay. What are you reading? Right now, I'm reading a novel called Line of Vision that Gary gave me, which is actually quite good. It won an Edgar Award, and I like a good thriller. And I decided to start my 2021 with something really positive. So I'm listening to Green Lights with Matthew McConaughey. And uh, it's a kind of a philosophical life book and he's actually reading it. So if I'm driving around my car, like one, it's just a really pleasant way to experience really positive thoughts is to have Ma Matthew McConaughey in your ear talking about green lights. It's literally green lights on the road. Like you want green lights in your life. So I can recommend that one pretty highly. I'll tell you about line of vision later. Okay. Um, you binge watching any TV shows? Yeah, um, I finally got around and watching the final season of Homeland. I don't know if you've ever watched that. Um, when we took our kids to England about five years ago, um, I was trying to get back on Austin time. So everybody was asleep but me, but I thought I'd get on my iPad and, and see what was on Netflix. Well, Homeland was free on Netflix in England where I was. And I watched like the first five episodes. I was up all night. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the best show ever. And I get home and I, we had to pay for it. So I probably, you know, I'd done it all the, I should have just gotten a Showtime subscription or whatever, but I'd just been piecemealing it, but it's great. It's fantastic series. Can I give you a couple tips to yes. like, everybody's already seen um, The Queen's Gambit. Got it. We all saw that. Same, some of the same actors are in an earlier Netflix miniseries called Godless. Okay. It takes about two episodes, but it's seven episodes. It's a Western. Jeff Daniels is the best villain I've ever seen, ever. Like he's up there with Darth Vader to me now. And it is fabulous writing. It's about a town where all the men die in a mining accident. So there's a Western town run by women. I mean, if that doesn't get you, I don't know what, what does. It's fabulous. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, you tell I like to talk about books and movies. So like, this is my this is my fun stuff. <laughs> well, that's why that's why I figured we'd end with this. Uh, board games, favorite board game. Oh gosh, historically it was always Risk. Um, we've had some epic games of Risk. Um, if you've ever played Exploding Kittens, this is now my kids. The Oatmeal dot com. Um, it's pretty funny. Okay, make a note oh, of that. Super Fight is another card game that I love to, I, I judge. But basically you get three cards, one is a person or a persona, and then two are superpowers. And then you argue about who would kill who in a fight. So you might get Darth Vader with a, um, the ability to be invisible in an army of zombies against Gandhi with the ability to levitate but flamethrower breath or something. And then you argue about who wins the fight. Is this for real, Jay? Totally real. It's called Super Fight. It's just for people who love to argue and debate. And watching my daughter and my wife challenge each other about who wins is hilarious. <laughs> All right, two more. What do you miss most from the pre-COVID world? Movies. Um, I'm actually an investor with Gary in a movie theater chain called the Alamo Draft House. It's like sells itself as the theater for movie lovers. And um, that was like a regular date night. That was a way that Wendy and I could spend time together, but you could go and eat dinner and have a movie. And, uh, but I also got to just hold her hand in the dark for a couple of hours. Um, and I love a good movie. My work brain turns off and uh, yeah. So yeah, I miss the theater experience. Awesome, me too. Last question, Talking, speaking about dreamy, I dream about the day when we can have events back in Austin. Yeah. So what we really need to know is what's your favorite restaurant in Austin? Wow, we're foodies. So if you've never been to Uchi, I'll tell you, it's a singular experience. Um, the chef there um, was like an iron chef at one point. He learned sushi in Japan from the masters, but then he brought a Texas fusion. And so you'll have like sushi with jalapenos and things like you've never had before. And um, I can just say that it's one of the only places I've ever been that I've only ever had the menu, the chef's menu. 
And I just trust them. I'm just like, if I ordered, I wouldn't know what to order. I just tell kind of the, the and they have fabulous service. So that is one of them. And I'm going to give you two because I know the chef. There's a place called Olame. Olame. And the chef is a guy named Michael Fotogé. I interviewed him um, when we were doing the one thing and after. He has been a James Beard finalist, I think, three times. And when he lived in New York, he was in New York. He was working in a, a, like a Michelin restaurant there. He was missing the South. We're both from, uh, he's near Memphis, Tennessee, where I grew up. And we bonded over biscuits and all this stuff. And he goes, oh, biscuits. When I was in New York and I was homesick, I got every kind of flour I could find and every kind of fat, right? Butter of all kinds. And I tried to figure out what the ultimate biscuit was. He spent a couple of years playing with it. And so they're not even on the menu. But if you go to Olame, the first thing you say is, we want to order a biscuits. And they bring it to you with a honey butter that they make in-house. And I mean, my mouth is watering. It is <laughs> like, I don't care if you're on a keto diet, you're blowing it. That is a delicacy to be had. Um, so Olame and Uchi would be two. You got two nights in Austin, knock those off. All right. We hope, hopefully that's one day soon. Jay, it has been absolutely delightful to get to spend some time with you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in person one day soon. I, I agree. I hope I can make it up to New Jersey. I know that Wendy and I would love to come up and visit whenever it's safe. And we look forward to seeing y'all in Austin. Thank you so much for having me. And hopefully people will, one, set bigger goals for their future and share them um, with their significant others so that this year they can navigate together. Thanks so much. That was that super was relaxed good. and fun. <laughs> Thank right. you. Now we're just gonna hit you up for a really quick teaser. Um, what is the event called? State of the Market. Okay. My heart just stopped. I did hit record, but Maria just went. <gasps> we're good. Okay. State of the Market. Um, I'm. And and Sharon, if I've been there, if for some reason we didn't have all of it or something, just call. We'll we'll have to schedule it again. We'll figure it out. Okay. Thanks. Right. I think we're good. I've been there. It's so embarrassing when it happens. <laughs> um. So. State of the Market, January 29th. Um, love it. I'll just, obviously for inside, you know, agents already at KW, that's an awesome message come, but we're really hoping to hit it out of the park in recruiting and making a difference in some of the minds of the agents that are not at KW. So take, do that with what you will. And if you can, you know, um, that's. So let's do it together. I'll, I'll start it off like, hey, I, this is Jay Papazian. I hope you'll join us for the State of the Market on January 29th. Um, among the many things you'll get to enjoy, hopefully you'll get to enjoy a conversation Shannon and I had about how billionaires set goals, how to think bigger for your life, how to work on your personal growth and leadership in 2021. Um, Shannon, how can they find out more about this? And I'll let you do the details of like the call to action because otherwise I'll have to read it. Yeah. Uh, they'll just be, are we using this anywhere that there wouldn't be a link embedded? There would not be, there, we're not going to use it anywhere where there would not be a standard. Perfect. So if you could just say what you just said, it was perfect. Okay, then I'll do that. Okay. Do you want to be on the screen with me? Maria? We are recording it two ways. So we're going to have split and we're going to have individuals so that we can slice it. So, so okay. I'll stay right However here. you want. That's you cool. Interview, so you're all good. All right. So keep it short though, right? Yeah, I think so. All right. Hey, everybody. Jay Papazan, co-author of The One Thing and The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. I hope you will join us for the State of the Market on January 29th. There's information right below this video in the link. Um, among the many other great trainings you'll get to have, hopefully you'll enjoy a conversation I got to have with Shannon about how to set bigger goals for your life, how to think bigger, how Gary sets goals, and how we can involve our loved ones, not just in our business, but also as we grow as humans, so we don't put a lid on our business. You don't want to miss it. You can't afford to miss it. We'll see you on January 29th. Bring a friend. That's awesome, Jay. Thanks so much. We'll see you then. All right.